Hello everyone, this is Sri from the San Antonio Food Bank. So this is going to be our last class in the holiday series. Um, so today we are going to talk about holiday food safety and kitchen basics. So um, before we start the class, I just have one question. So my question is, it is required uh, to store meat and meat products separately from produce and other food. Do uh, you think it's true or false? So let's see, um, you know, if it's true or false, along with other things that we are going to learn today. So, um, so what is food safety basically? This is a very, very, very important topic of nutrition, but then it's sometimes ignored because they think it's not important or they think people, they assume people already know. But then um, from my personal experience, when I first started working in the kitchen two years back, I knew nothing. Um, all I knew was I had to clean. Um, that's, that's all I knew about food safety. But then I learned a lot. So I hope you learned something from today's session. Um, so but food safety refers to the conditions and practices that preserve the quality of food to prevent contamination and foodborne illnesses. So this is really, really important. And practicing food and kitchen safety can prevent illness and injury in the um, kitchen. And um, you can play an important part in the food safety and preventing foodborne illnesses. So if you are someone who's constantly handling food, it is required that you get a food handler's certificate. So the food handler certificate will talk about, um, you know, the food safety. So there are different um, categories, but then uh, it is required that you actually have the certificate. And a foodborne illness is an infection or irritation of the digestive system caused by food or beverages with harmful bacteria, parasites, viruses, or chemicals. So this can be either um, microorganisms or it can be contamination from other food. So what causes a foodborne illness? So it can be, again, as I said, bacteria, parasite, virus, or chemical. And some of the common symptoms can be vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever, and chills. So um, if you're someone who works in the kitchen and if you have any of these symptoms, they would actually recommend or advise that you not come for work because these can be um, you know, means to actually, even though you're like sanitizing and washing your hands and all that, this can be uh, some ways where you can pass the, um, you know, microorganisms to food. Most foodborne illnesses are acute and most people recover on own without treatment, but there can be some chronic conditions too. Um, so again, these are nothing but contaminants. And there are three types of contaminants. So it can be physical, it can be chemical, or it can be biological. So physical can be the hair, nails. Uh, chemical can be, say, if you have, um, I don't know, say maybe bleach or detergent near your food station, and then even in your kitchen for that matter, say if you have bleach and detergent or the dish liquid that you wash just close by, and just if it spills, it's going to be a chemical contamination. And then biological is nothing but the microorganisms. So foodborne illnesses is a common but costly yet preventable public health problem. Each year, one in six people get sick from, uh, sick from contaminated food or drink in the US. About 48 million people every year, 3,000 die due to foodborne illnesses. So we did see that it's preventable and it's acute, but there are conditions where um, you know, it can become a chronic, um, say, illness, and people might suffer, um, you know, very severely. People might also die. And um, so what is some, um, you know, example? Like salmonella is a very common, um, you know, bacteria, and um, that causes foodborne illness. It results in more hospitalizations and deaths than any other bacteria. And um, annual direct medical cost is $365 million. So um, imagine how, many, 
how much of money goes into just treating or preventing, uh, I'm sorry, just treating the disease, right? So instead, if you focus on preventing it, you don't even have to spend so much. And reducing foodborne illness by 10% would keep 5 million Americans from getting sick each year. So um, it is really, really important. As I said, we kind of ignore um, a simple act as um, you know, washing the produce before cooking can be a very good, um, you know, like a practice or a habit, and that can prevent these type of, um, you know, diseases. And uh, also cooking meat to its temperature, which we will see. So uh, it's also important to avoid unsafe or risky foods. Um, so there are four steps to for food safety. So it is important to clean, this, which, I, uh, which I mentioned is the very first step. And it's important to separate from produce. Uh, it is important to separate the produce from meat. So it is, you should not store them or you should, you can cook them, but then even while processing like cutting, you have to use separate cutting boards. And it is important to cook uh, at appropriate temperature. And it is important that you store food, um, you know, in the proper temperature as well. So the first one would be clean. So to reduce the spread of bacteria, wash hands with soap and hot water for 20 seconds. Clean, um, they say usually you sing happy birthday while you, you know, wash your hands. And um, that would be a 20 second count. And clean raw produce under running water or in a water and vinegar solution. You may consider using a small vegetable brush to remove the excess dirt. Um, you know, like the cruciferous vegetables, like say cauliflower or lettuce or, um, you know, broccoli, these can be a bit hard to clean, but then it's very, very important to clean them because there can be um, soil or any bacteria and microorganisms in the creeks and, you know, the the crevices of the vegetable. Um, so one good thing what I do with cauliflower is I soak them for say 20 or 30 minutes in salt water. Um, so that way I, I just think anything that's inside would actually come out. You can also cut them and soak them that way, um, you know, uh, more regions are exposed to the salt water. And wipe down with soap or hot water, all cutting boards, surfaces, and utensils before and after use to prevent cross-contamination. So um, you can tell me, Shri, it's just me at home and you know, getting two or three cutting boards would be a waste of money. Yes, I understand. Um, and there are also cutting sheets that you can get. Um, I, I, I use only cutting sheets and not cutting boards. So it's very easy. They come in four colors so you can separate them. Or um, what you can do is you, you can just make sure you process everything. Um, you, you know, while you process everything, you wash before and after. Say if you process meat in the same cutting board, you can thoroughly rinse them and then use, um, you know, use it for your produce. And um, it is also important to actually use um, on food, like on the surfaces where you actually tend to say serve food or make food, it is important to use food safe cleaner. So you can go about using um, all the detergent or bleach, even in dishwasher, it is important to actually use, um, you know, something that's food safe. Um, not, not the dish soap, like dishwasher soap, but uh, say if you're if you spray something in the dishwasher, it is important to see if it's food safe. So um, if you see this picture, it's it's a bit clumsy. Um, you can see how um, it's actually mixed, like the meat is mixed with the basil and all that. So um, it is important to separate them. Um, see, these are the cutting boards that's actually recommended. So red for raw meat. Fruits and vegetables like produce go in green, um, poultry go in yellow, fish goes in blue, and cooked animal products, they usually go in brown or um, there's actually another color too. Um, it can go, um, I want to say a few kitchen because the kitchen that I work, it had uh, raw meat in red and cooked one in yellow. So it can be that way and bread and baked foods go in white. So um, it is important to actually separate them. Um, say if you see a kitchen or if you're working in a kitchen or if you want to work in a kitchen or just 
you know, in general, this is good knowledge to you. Um, that's where you see the colors, the different colors in the cutting board. And always keep raw meat, poultry, and seafood separate from other foods when shopping, storing in refrigerator, and when using in cutting boards. Um, so this answers our questions. So store any raw meat, poultry, and seafood in separate containers or plastic bags to avoid juices from leaking. So uh, it is also important to say if you have a big family or um, say if you're just one person and you buy in bulk, it's okay. But what you have to do is you, you must already separate them and store them. You can't um, store them, like say you can freeze the meat, take it out, cut it once, and then refreeze it again. No, that's going to be unsafe. So while you get, um, wh when you get the meat, you have to make sure you separate it, put it in a separate Ziploc or any, um, you know, box or power, and then store them. Wash your hands, any dishes used, cutting boards and knives between to avoid cross contamination. So um, next, when it comes to cooking. So food safety cooking tips in cooking animal proteins to the correct temperature will destroy most harmful bacteria. So they say with the turkey, you should not wash the turkey in the sink. You should make sure to just cook the turkey. I mean, you can definitely rinse it off for, um, you know, I'm sure it doesn't have any soil, but then um, you should make sure you cook the turkey instead of washing it because it can be bacteria that would be on the sink and all that that can go into your other food. And always use a food thermometer to check temperature. So with meat, um, there's, there's a small device. So it would just be this, um, you know, this size and there'd be um, the temperature. So you can use the thermometer to actually uh, you can poke the meat and see. Um, once it goes to the steady temperature, you can check the temperature. And uh, it's better to avoid the visual doneness because sometimes it can be visually done outside, but then it may not be cooked, thoroughly cooked on the inside. So it's important to actually, you know, um, use the thermometer um, to figure out the temperature and, and if it's cooked because it would be even if you use the thermometer. So as you can see here, the numbers, it should be 145 degree Fahrenheit for fish, pork, roast, or steak. Um, and it should be the eggs should be cooked at 155 degree Fahrenheit. Ground meat should be at 160 degree Fahrenheit. And leftover poultry should be at 165 degree Fahrenheit. Um, so when it comes to poultry, so basically it was for turkey, but I know Thanksgiving is already over. But then when it comes to poultry, you have to properly um, defrost and thaw your turkey to avoid foodborne illness. So can anyone tell me, it's just a question, can anyone tell me how to, um, how do you thaw? How do you thaw meat or anything? Any idea? Do you thaw it in the refrigerator? Okay. To, uh, to unthaw it or you can keep it in its um, packaging and run water over it? Yes, exactly. So you have to um, dethaw it in cold running water. So uh, people just assume that you can thaw in hot water because it would thaw easily. Yes, it would thaw easily or quicker compared to cold water, but then you have to thaw it in cold running water. Or you can also um, put it in the refrigerator. Um, but again, um, it totally depends on the food that you, you know, that you want to prepare. So it's always good to thaw it in cold running water and cooking. Remember to ensure the turkey is fully cooked all the way through. Um, so again, it can be turkey or any poultry and storing um, refrigerate leftovers within two hours and use proper storage containers. So it's also important to use um, storage containers that are appropriate, say if you take a bowl, if it says it can be freezed, you should not freeze it. You should, you should only refrigerate it. So it's important to know the um, the symbols um, that is mentioned, that is put in the containers um, to actually use it appropriately. Same goes for microwave, right? Because if you use something that's not microwave safe, it's going to get into the food. Again, that's that's another chemical contamination there. So with, um, you know, um, it's the one that we saw in the previous uh, two slides before is the same, but then uh, this, this is the danger zone. So um, if you actually see if it should be cooked, um, I, yeah, it should be cooked um, at 145 
degree Fahrenheit, it should not, if it's below 40 to 140, um, it's going to actually be danger zone. It's going to consider that, um, you know, consider that the microorganisms are not completely destroyed. So um, this is important. It's, it goes for the pork, fish, ground meat, or poultry, as we saw in the previous slide. Um, so this is the storage fact. So basically, um, where you should store um, roast or steak is above meats and below vegetables. So it is important because say if you have um, any leaks, they don't get into the vegetables. Again, pork and fish is the same. Ground meat, bottom or middle shelf, and poultry in the bottom shelf. Because if it's going to leak, um, we have to make sure it doesn't leak in other things, especially produce. Um, so with ready to cook items um, or food, uh, freezing food kills bacteria, but they don't, uh, some, not, not always. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, freezing food does not kill bacteria. Was, yeah, so only cooking food um, kills bacteria. So it's important to actually uh, cook them. It's not enough only if you actually freeze them. So um, freezing doesn't kill bacteria. When you thaw your food, bacteria that was present before will still be there. The only way to kill bacteria is to properly thaw and properly bake or cook to appropriate temperature. So ready to cook foods like raw or packaged cookie dough, um, frozen entrees or dessert mixes must be cooked, baked before eating. So um, say if you buy a pack of, um, you know, or cookie dough, um, make sure you don't taste it before because it has to be cooked to actually, you know, destroy all the bacteria. And eating raw flour and eggs increase exposure to E. coli and salmonella. So only cooking properly can kill these germs. And resist the urge to eat the raw dough or batter for cookies, tortillas, pizzas, cakes, etc. Follow the cooking directions for a happy holiday. So it's important that you actually cook them um, in the proper temperature that's required to avoid, um, you know, the exposure to E. coli or salmonella. So here, uh, yeah, so this was what I was about to say. So freezing actually stops the growth, but it does not kill. So, um, and especially freezing, um, you know, below zero degree Fahrenheit to 20 degree, minus 20 degree Fahrenheit. And a refrigeration, it slows the bacterial growth. That's why sometimes thawing, once you freeze it, um, thawing, is, thawing in the refrigerator would not be a good idea. Um, so um, basically refrigeration is between 32 degree Fahrenheit to 40 degree Fahrenheit. And this is where the danger zone is because it's the ideal temperature where harmful bacteria like can grow. So that's why if it's safe, it's damp, it's moist, and if it's in that temperature, um, there can be some um, you know, bacterial or microorganisms that can grow. And um, 140 degree Fahrenheit to 160 degree Fahrenheit, it prevents harmful bacterial growth. So it's important to uh, cook above 140. And 160 to 212 um, degree Fahrenheit can actually uh, kill most of the harmful bacteria. So, um, but then again, it depends on the food. Um, say, if there's going to be fish, um, you can cook up to 165 because you can burn it. So it's important to actually, um, you know, go with the appropriate um, measures. Um, so this is the reason why we want to actually, um, you know, reduce the food um, to stay in the room temperature because this is the danger zone and this is the ideal temperature for the growth. So uh, tips to store, um, you know, cold food, uh, divide food um, into smaller portions, then place in the refrigerator and use freezer safe containers or plastic bags when freezing food for one to three months. Because even with freezing, not only microwaving, but then even with freezing, sometimes the meat or anything can stick to the, um, you know, the wrapper or the plastic bag that's not microwave safe. And um, it can actually just be, you know, stuck to it and it would be so hard to separate. And that's why it's important to use that freezer safe. And if serving cold food, place food container over ice 
to maintain temperature. So um, even when you put something outside, say if you have milk outside or, um, you know, just if you're serving for in a large event and then if you have milk outside or any juice or anything, it's important to actually store, um, you know, in a, you can have a tray with, filled with ice and then you can store it on top of that. So um, storing holiday leftovers, be sure to clear out your fridge in the days leading to a big holiday meal to make sure you have room for the leftovers. Again, um, I think I've spoken about this in the first class. Storing food is also an art because if you say, if you store something behind, you have to make sure to clean the refrigerator regularly because if you store something behind, it can be actually difficult to remember and you might just forget and it would, you know, it would just go waste or it might develop um, again, some microorganisms or mold. Um, so it's important to store effectively and leftover turkey should be cut in pieces and be done, um, I, I, I'm sorry, and, and deboned before storage. Bones can be used for broths and soups. Um, have a plan on how to use those leftovers so they don't spoil and go waste. So um, if you have any leftovers, refrigerate them within two hours to avoid food falling within danger zone. Um, put leftovers in shallow containers, preferably, preferably two inches in depth. Um, after four days in refrigerator, throw away any leftovers because again, it's even though if it's in uh, if it's in the safe temperature, it's not going to be good once it's cooked. So that's why it's important to follow the appropriate um, you know um, number of days. Again, so if it's you can see the difference here, right? Um, you are not supposed to store food like this because if you store it, it's going to something or other is going to leak from the top to bottom um, and also here. So it's important to store it in a proper way. And um, so what can be some of the storage tips? Wrap and label meat, fish and poultry that you plan to freeze. So sometimes uh, labeling anything for that matter in the fridge can be very useful, especially um, if you share food with others, say if you have a roommate, um, you know, it's important to actually label them. And then dairy and eggs should be stored in the coldest part of the fridge, usually near the back and away from the door. Um, so again, this is important. Sometimes I see people store eggs in their drawer. Um, it can be good, but then um, it's important to also make sure, um, you know, it can be safe, but then it's important to make sure um, there's appropriate temperature. And then put meat in the meat drawer or the lowest um, shelf of the refrigerator and use the crispier or produce uh, drawers for crisper or produced drawers for veggies. So this way it's, it's actually the drawers are actually covered and then nothing leaks into it. But then if you see gaps in the refrigerator, um, it is important you store them properly or in a bag. And then with pantry, canned goods last two years plus a two plus years, but can be damaged by temperature above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's again, it's important to store them properly, even though they're in the can. Mayo and peanut butter can be stored in the pantry. Move mayo to the fridge when it's open. So there are some food uh, items. If you see, say, take HEB or Walmart, it would be stored in shelf. But then uh, once you open it, um, for example, a very big mistake, a very common mistake that I think that I see people do is they store pasta sauce outside after it's open because they think it's actually not stored in the, you know, the folder sec section of the aisle. Um, it's stored outside. But then once you open it, the vacuum breaks and it's important to store it in the refrigerator. And keep potatoes in cool, dark part of the pantry. Remove any that start to grow, uh, that starts to go bad. Onions like the same condition, but don't put them together. Potatoes and onions should be separated. So it's important to separate them. I think probably there might be some chemical reaction. Um, fruits with pits like peaches and plums should be placed in a closed paper bag until ripe, then refrigerator. Um, so if you, re even avocados, if you refrigerate it, say if you get a bunch of avocados, what I do is if I get a whole bag, um, I just put one or two outside and refrigerate the uh, rest so that they don't ripe 
um, easily. And when I want probably two or three days before, I would put them outside. Uh, keep tomatoes in the pantry only if they'll be eaten within one or two days. Otherwise, they'll go in the fridge. So again, tomatoes, a lot of produce are actually stored outside if you see the store. Uh, but then for us, it's important to actually put them in the refrigerator because they aim on selling everything soon so they don't have to worry about um, you know refrigeration but for us if you're not going to use that immediately it's important to actually you know um, put it in the fridge and um, so how to use your holiday leftovers um, so cranberry sauce cranberry oatmeal cranberry yogurt perfect mashed potatoes it can be made into potato cakes or potato rolls sweet potatoes pancakes or waffles sweet potato falafel um, green beans can be added to soup or frittata and um, with the turkey, ham, roast beef, meat alternatives, turkey and cranberry, um, grilled cheese, turkey salad, hot ham and cheese, sandwich, sandwich can be a very good option, roast beef, sandwich, bone broths and soups. With pumpkin, pumpkin pie smoothies, um, roasted pumpkin seeds, um, apples, apples, apple pie Perfect apple pie oatmeal, baked apples, pecans, pumpkin spice roasted pecans. So you can definitely add the spices and roast them. Um, so with kitchen safety, so it's important to know the difference between all, um, you know, all of these knives and what you use, which knife you use for, uh, you know, which produce or which purpose. So basically, this is the bread knife. This is the chef knife, and this can be used for meat. And um, not 100% sure about other names, but you can jump in here. Um, but then you can use all of these for you know everything. And it's important how to handle the knife. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate today along with a small recipe. So uh, it's important to know how to handle a knife in order to be safe. Um, and kitchen fires. So, um, 172,900 um, home structure uh, fires per year started by cooking activities in 2014 to 2018. That's a lot, um, you know, for being at home. Um, in 2018, fire department responded to an average if 470 home cooking fires per day. And households that use electric ranges have a higher risk of cooking fires and associated losses than using gas ranges. Because I think sometimes you just leave, I've done that you know, quite a few times where I just turn, I, I remove something from the fire and forget that it's on because I don't see the fire there. But then if I come after say half hour, I see it's still on. Sometimes that can be dangerous. Um, so yeah, that's for today's, class, um, I mean the PowerPoint, but I'm going to demonstrate the recipe. Today we are going to actually make a simple holiday beverage. It's going to be infused water, but I'm going to show you how to use um, your knife. Okay, so whenever you, um, I washed all, the, all of the produce. So today we are going to make infused water. So um, whenever you take the produce, you have to, so this is the cloth. So you have to hold it this way. So do you see how I'm holding it? So that way, when you cut the, your fingers actually are safe. So that's why we call it the claw method. So look at this. I'm going to be cutting the orange like this. So this way I can save my fingers Say if I'm holding it like this and I'm cutting it, it's going to say if I'm, you know, quick or if I'm not actually concentrating here, which is bad, I want to cut my fingers. Whereas if you hold it like this, you can actually cut it this way. So I have my oranges here and with the cucumber. So what I'm going to do is, So this is another. So I'm going to so say this is the cucumber, right? If I want to um, do them in coins, I can do it this way. But say if I want them to be, uh, you know, the long squares, I can hold it like this and I can 
cut it this way. So that way I save my fingers as well. So I'm going to hold it like this and I cut in the middle. So this way I also get the shape that I want. So I know it takes some time because sometimes when you're very quick, this might, um, if you are a very quick person in the kitchen, this might slow you down, but it's also important to follow the safety. This way and um, have a lemon. Actually, somewhere between lime and lemon, but this way. And for the final, uh, so this is basil. We grew this in the food bank. So just to have more space, what I'm going to do is I have a pitcher here. So I have a picture, so I'm going to put all of this in the, I'm adding all of this to the picture. So I've added oranges. This is cucumber. And I'm also adding the lime. And um, so here comes the basil. So you can do, um, two things, two or three things with the basil here. You can actually take the basil and hold it this way where I've, you know, put it on top and fold the basil and cut it. So you, and then I'm adding it to the picture. So I'll demonstrate it again. So I'm just taking the basil here and see, I've just stacked them and then I'm folding the basil and then I'm chopping them and then I'm adding it to the picture. So I'll just do, or you can also, the other way to do it is also, you can mince the basil. This can also be another way if you don't have time to fold. So um, you can either mince it with one hand here, or you can use both your hands to mince it here. So it totally depends on how you want to do it and how you would like to present it. So I'm adding it to the picture. So um, what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to uh, here. So I have the picture here. So it has orange, cucumbers, lime, and basil. I'm just going to add water to it. I'm just gonna add this much. So if you see, this contains all the, this is nothing but infused water and you can use it um, instead of soda or you know any other beverage that you serve during the holidays or just in general. This avoids the sugar that we consume. And because we add herbs to it, you can do, uh, um, you can do basil, you can do mint, you can do parsley, you can do any kind of herbs or you can just do, um, you know, this is going to be citrus and um, cucumber because we added orange and lime, but then you can also do berries. So you can just add berries like say blueberries, strawberry, um, raspberries, and then store them. So another way to do this is um, because it's winter now, you can just uh, have this in room temperature 
or you can also serve it cold. So um, we would recommend not to store this more than two days. So you can have this for two days. And if it's, um, you know, you can just um, throw it after two days because what happens is one, it starts becoming unsafe. And um, two, the bitterness of the orange or the lime or lemon starts getting into the water. And it's not going to be as tasty as it should be or it might be. Um, so that's why it's important to dispose it. And that's why we say label it. Um, and this can also be, it can be during, used during holidays or it can also be used at your home regularly. Um, so yeah, this is one simple but easy. And um, so at least it avoids sugar, even though you know not a lot of nutrients, but I'm sure um, vitamin C from the citrus uh, would actually, you know, get into the water. 